are in our current sermon series, The Best Part of Christmas, and we're breaking this down. And as I was thinking about that this week, I, I came across this illustration. I think it just really highlights what Christmas is really, truly all about. A butterfly begins as a what? A caterpillar. That's right. Y'all are so sharp this morning. Everybody's got this down. Okay, so a, a, a butterfly begins his life as a caterpillar. A caterpillar just basically exists. That's all they do. They just exist and they eat. And when they get done eating, they hang themselves upside down from a stick, and then an amazing transformation begins. During the chrysalis process, chrysalis, that's how it is, chrysalis process, chrysalis, you know what, I even listened to the pronunciation, like right before I came down here, I was like, this is so important, I got to get this word right, so I sound like I know what I'm talking about, and I hit play like three times on it, and I even like enunciated it correctly in here, and I still mess it up, the chrysalis process, okay, it's almost as if the caterpillar, the butterfly, whatever you want to call it, it's almost as if it goes from death to life. If you remember back to that video that we showed just a few minutes ago, I mean, that, that caterpillar is hanging upside down, and it went really fast, and it was showing you in really fast motion what happens, but it's almost as if the, the body of the caterpillar disintegrates, and a very hard shell is formed, which honestly looks like a tomb. I, I, when I was thinking about that, I was seeing all those the chrysalis hanging up there, and it's, it's like it's a tomb, and then on the chrysalis. <laughs> Y'all need to pray for me. I need a lot of help. <laughs> it's almost as if it looks like a tomb, and then on the other side of the tomb, what happens? This, this beautiful, amazing transformation breaks free, and you have the life of the butterfly. And to me, this is what Christmas is all about. It's about the complete amazing transformation that takes place in every single one of our hearts and in every single one of our lives. Christmas, God loved us enough that he sent his only begotten son. Jesus loved us enough that he was willing to leave heaven and he was willing to come to this earth. And I love the song that the teenager sang at the beginning. I mean, Jesus Christ could have came in glory. He could have came in power. All of the nations of the earth could have been bowing before him, but he chose to come humbly. And he came as a servant and he was born in a manger and he was born for one specific reason and one specific reason alone to go to a cross and die. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus lived his life. He fulfilled his time on earth. He went to a cross. And on that cross, he died to pay the penalty for our sins. He died in my place. He died in your place. And he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again from the grave. And he defeated sin. And he defeated death. And he defeated hell. And he defeated the grave. And when we believe in him... When we recognize the fact that we can do nothing to save ourselves, but that it is completely dependent on what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, an amazing transformation takes place. We go from death to life. We walk in newness of life. We walk in the freedom of the Spirit, and everything about life is different and changed. And you know what we call that amazing news? We call it the gospel. Christmas is all about the gospel. This, this big old gift box up here, it represents the gospel, the greatest news, the greatest gift that has ever been given. Jesus Christ, who died and was buried and rose again so that we could have new life in him, so that we could be transformed. The best part of Christmas is not all of the family traditions that we have and all of the parties that you're going to go to. The best part of Christmas is experiencing Christ. And as we experience Christ, we also get to experience all the amazing gifts that come along with him. And that's where, why we're in Romans chapter 8. We are unwrapping and looking at the amazing gifts that come along with Jesus Christ. Now, i got to go back to the butterflies one more time before we jump into this. And hopefully... Chrysalis, if I have to say that again, I'll get it right, okay? But one of the things that's so amazing about those butterflies, when they first emerge, okay, it was a caterpillar, now it's a butterfly, it's this beautiful, amazing transformation, but when it first emerges, it's an awkward, beautiful creation. 
A lot like we are when we emerge, when we go from death to life. Yes, we're new creations in Christ, but there's a lot that has to happen and change. And one of the things that that butterfly does is it hangs upside down and his wings are, they're small, they're tiny, they're feeble. And his abdomen is swollen with fluid. And immediately, you know what that butterfly begins to do? He begins to pump his wings. And as he pumps his wings, the fluid leaves his abdomen, and it begins to flow into his wings, and those wings all of a sudden start expanding. And if you go back and you, if you go to YouTube, okay, and just Google that process, you'll see it. At the end of that video, even, it was amazing. The wings were small. He starts pumping them, and you can just see them begin to fill and swell. And when all of the fluid is dry, and when those wings reach their full capacity, that butterfly flies off and lives the life that God created him to live. You know what Romans 8 is? Romans 8 is that fluid that you and I need to become everything that God created us to be. As we go through these gifts and as we unwrap the truth that we're looking at in this passage, it's almost as if we find the strength that we need. It's almost as if we we get into God's word and we soak it up and we begin to be filled with all that we need so that we can go out and live the transformed life that God intended for us to live and that he created for us to live. So are you ready to dive into Romans chapter eight? Oh, that didn't sound very convincing. Are you all ready to dive into Romans chapter eight this morning? Okay, there we go. That's what I'm talking about. All right, first thing I want us to look at this morning is this, a new mindset, a new mindset. The gospel truly does change everything. Now, I'm just gonna give you a real quick review. We're not gonna look at verses three and four, but Last week, we talked about, one of the last things that we talked about was the fact that Jesus broke the condemning power of the law. When he died on the cross, he condemned the law. He condemned the condemning power of the law. That that law no longer has power over us to tell us that we are guilty sinners because Jesus died and he paid the penalty for sin and he rose again. And he set us free from the condemning power of the law so that we could do what? so that we could fulfill the law. It's amazing. We couldn't fulfill the law in and of ourselves. We couldn't do anything that's pleasing to God. But as soon as that amazing transformation takes place, and as soon as we're free from that condemning power of the law, all of a sudden, we are now able to fulfill the righteousness of the law. Jesus didn't set us free from sin so we could go back to sin. He set us free so that we could live in a brand new way. And how do we do that? The end of verse 4 tells us that, You do that by not walking according to the flesh, but you do that by walking according to the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us that enables us to live a new life. Well, how do we we walk in the Spirit? How do we live in this new way? Well, verse 5 tells us that we have a new mindset. Everybody look what it says here in verse 5. It says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The key word in verse 5 is the mind. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That word mind, it means to set our mind. It means to value, to cherish. And when we were in the flesh, we set our mind. We valued and cherished the things of the flesh. Just to summarize it and to make it really simple for all of us un- to understand. The thing I, <laughs> when I was in the flesh, I valued and cherished what I wanted, when I wanted it, however I wanted it. And because that's where my mindset is, then the decisions that I make and the things that I do are affected by my thinking. And they're selfish and they're self-centered and they're about me and they're about the flesh and they're not naturally about God and they're not naturally about others. But I am now in the spirit. My life has been transformed. My life has been changed and I now have a new mindset. I value and and cherish the things of the spirit of God which completely changes everything. So here's our first practical application. We're just going to get right into the practical side of all of this quickly. Pursue life and peace. Pursue life and peace. I have some gifts in here this morning. We're going to jump right into this. All right, so see how talented I am today because I have to be able to speak in this so people on live stream can hear me. And if you're joining us on live stream, we are glad to have you here in a part of our service today. Y'all excited to see what's inside the boxes today? There we go. 
You guys are a lively crowd today. I like it. All right. Hopefully I can get in these easy. All right, here we go. Our first gift this morning is Hawaiian Lays. All right, how many of you would love it if you opened up a Christmas gift on Christmas morning and, man, you had one of these in here and you found out that you were going on a trip to paradise. You were headed to Hawaii, maybe for a week, maybe for two weeks. I mean, how many of you think that would be a pretty awesome gift? Yeah, I see a lot of people in here that would like it. Maybe it's not Hawaii. Whatever paradise is for you, what if you opened up the presents on Christmas morning and, man, that is where you were headed. That's where you were going. That would be incredible. Can I tell you this morning that what we have in Christ is better than a vacation to paradise? And the reason why the transformation that takes place when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ is the beginning of a perpetual state of paradise. Let me say that one more time. Because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and because we can fulfill the righteousness of the law, even though we won't know what full paradise is like until we see Christ face to face, the beginning of eternal life starts now. And God wants us, when we are in our minds, in the right mindset, when we're valuing and cherishing the things of the Spirit, He wants us to pursue life in peace. Look at verse 6. Look at how this plays out. It says in verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. All right, so the mindset of the flesh is death. All right, so for instance, just some words that come along with when we're thinking about what I want, how I want it, when I want it, and the decisions that we make based on that. You know what that ends up producing? Jealousy, envy, fear, anger, lust. Worry, revenge, vindication. I mean, I could go down the list and I could say words like that. And those words are not associated with life and peace. Those words are associated with anxiety and death. Just to give you a quick little test of how quickly we can get into the flesh, I promise you I can probably say three words in here this morning. And with those three words, the majority of people in here, many people in here, will instantly be in the flesh. You want to try this test out? <laughs> Mandy all shook her head and said, no, I don't want to know what this is. It's a mild test, okay? I can say these three words. I can say Florida State, Alabama. And instantly, we can be in the flesh if you're college football fans. I mean, if you're an Alabama fan, the pride swells up instantly, and you're like, ha, 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 and you laugh. And that's not the kind of pride God wants us to have. And if you're a Florida State fan, you can just think you got robbed, and the injustice, and the vindication, and the boycott, and the strike, and everything's wrong and broken in this world. I mean, that's all you got to do. You can just bring up college football, and instantly we can see how our flesh rises up and wants to go to battle. On a more serious note, because that's just sports, and sports should not really cause our spirits to get that affected for too long, okay? But on a serious note, (laughs) probably not at all, but I added the too long in there. (laughs) On a serious note, some of you are probably going to head to work tomorrow. And some of those feelings, some of those words might be associated with some working relationships. Some of you have Christmas coming up and there may be certain members of the family or extended family that show up and there may be brokenness there. And all I'm trying to say is that when we walk according to the flesh, when it's about our rights and our desires and what we want, that is a life that produces death. The mindset of the spirit, look back at verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. When we value and cherish the things of the spirit, like peace, contentment, forgiveness, dying to self, I think of the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, 
temperance, which is self-control, faith, all of those different things, they produce a completely different result. They produce life and peace. And even though we live in a broken world where we have to battle and fight our flesh, God wants us to be able to begin to taste and experience that perpetual state of paradise that is going to come when one day we step into his presence. But you can already taste and see that now. Pursue life and peace. Do you understand? We are living Walking, breathing miracles. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says this, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Everybody read verse 8 out loud with me. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Do you understand what those verses are saying? When we were in the flesh... Before we put our faith in Jesus as our Savior, we were enemies to God. There was a hostility in our lives, whether we realize it or not, to God. We were his enemies. We could not submit to his laws. There was nothing that we could do in and of ourselves to please him. But I'm thankful for the way the next verse begins. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And he's changed everything. Man, when we were in the flesh, we were like that caterpillar. We just existed. And we go through life and we eat and we do the things that we think are going to produce happiness. And all that ends up happening is we put ourselves in a tomb of our own making. And there are all kinds of people around here today that on the outside it looks like they're alive. and it But inside they are living inside of a tomb of death and hopelessness that is of their own making. But the good news about Christmas is there is a way out. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, it doesn't just change. Things transform and change in an absolutely incredible way. And life and peace can be a part of all of our lives because of what Jesus Christ did for us. So point number one, pursue life and peace. All right. Here we go. Number two, not only do we have a new mindset, but we have a new presence. Look at verse nine. It says this, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God, everybody, what's that next word out loud? Dwell. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. One of my favorite parts of Christmas is the company. I love when company comes to your house and they stay. I remember as a kid, I have some incredible Christmas memories, but at the top of the list was always waiting for my grandparents to show up. My grandparents, Pap and Grandma, they were about as epic of grandparents as you could possibly imagine. They had a big old awesome station wagon. Man, I love that station wagon. I, told, I used to tell my grandfather when I was a kid, I was like, Pap, when you're gone, could I have your station wagon? I thought that thing was like a miracle. Yeah, I did that. I said that. That's crazy. Kids don't know what they're saying all the time, too. But I love that station wagon because every time they would come in, when I knew that they were like 20 minutes from the house or 30 minutes from the house, I would go out, start looking out the windows. I'd be out in their driveway, and all of a sudden that station wagon would turn down the driveway, and the horn would beep. And that thing was packed from the top to the back with presents and gifts and snacks and candy and everything that all 10 of their grandchildren that lived in the same house loved. So you can imagine that thing's overflowing. They were amazing grandparents, and I loved it. They would come, and they would stay for a few days, and while they stayed, they would take us to McDonald's and buy us Happy Meals, and they would take us to the grocery store and get us whatever cereal we wanted. It was awesome. It was a great time. But do you understand that Christmas isn't about company showing up temporarily? It's about company coming to stay permanently. Got another This one's not a wrapped gift, but I got in here. What is this thing right here? Everybody tell me, what is this? This is a moving box. Do you understand that the true meaning of Christmas is all about company coming to stay permanently in your life? That word dwell. I want to back up a little bit. You don't need to turn there, but John chapter 1, one of my favorite Christmas passages. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then you skip down to verse 14, and it says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
That word dwell in John chapter 1 has to do with the idea of a tabernacle or a tent. And what's absolutely amazing about this is the Son of God became flesh to set up a tabernacle, to set up his tent, to dwell among his creation. And he lived among his people for a little over 30 years until he went to a cross and he died and he ascended back into heaven. But when he ascended back into heaven, he said, don't worry, don't fear, because I'm going to send my comforter. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And you get here to Romans chapter 8 and you get here to verse 9 and you find out that we are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, the word dwell here is different than the one in John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, it has the idea of setting up a tabernacle, a tent. Here, it's a different word that comes from the word house, and it means to live with, to inhabit. The Spirit isn't just present in my life. The Spirit dwells. He inhabits me. My body is his home. I am his tabernacle. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he didn't just show up with a suitcase to stay temporarily. He's not just sitting on a couch in the corner of your house, that family member that you know is there, but you're not really paying that much close attention to. That should be the furthest thing from who Jesus is in our life. He, this body is his home. This is where he lives. This is where he dwells. We are inhabited people. Now look how this plays out. Verses 9 in the beginning of verse 10. Now pay close attention. I'm going to have you read a few words with me. It says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Sorry, I messed up. Go back. I'm going to go back to that phrase. If so be that the spirit of everybody, what's that word? God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of, he is none of his. And then everybody read the first line of verse 10. And if Christ be in you. Now, if you're reading through this and you're paying close attention, you might get a little bit confused because you're going to start wondering, well, is the spirit the spirit of God? Because that's what he said, the spirit of God. And then in the very next line, he says, and the spirit of Christ. So who is he? Is the spirit the spirit of God or is the spirit the spirit of Christ? And then in verse 10, he really throws another curveball in there because he says, not if the spirit is in you. He says, now, and if Christ be in you. So what's going on here? Who's indwelling me? Who's living inside of me? Do I have the spirit of God? Do I have the spirit of Christ? Is it the spirit in me or is it in Christ in me? How does all of this work? This is beautiful. This is part of who God is. He is the Trinity. He is three in one. He is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And the spirit is equally the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ. And the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ that is at work inside of you, you know what he's doing? He is communicating Christ to you in such a way that as you begin to transform and change, you could easily say that it's not the Spirit that's in you, it's Christ that's in you because that's his job. His job is to communicate Christ and to transform us, to make us like Christ. And all of this boils down to this point. There is a new presence inside of you. You have all of God there is to get. And all of God is at work in you to make you like Christ. Now, how many of you think that's a pretty amazing and awesome truth right there? So here's the practical application. We've got to practice God's presence. We've got to practice God's presence. The people that are closest to you are typically continually present in your mind, all right? So when you go throughout the day, throughout the week, what do you typically do with your spouse or with your friends or the people that you're closest to? You might not physically be by them all of the time, but they're constantly on your mind. And when you think about them throughout the day, what do you do? You call them. People don't call that much anymore. So what's the, really the other thing that you do? You text them. And if you've been married for any length of time, like 20 years or so, what you do is you sit on the couch next to each other at night, you have the television on, but you're looking at your phones, and you send each other reels, and you laugh, and you don't even talk to each other while you're sending each other reels. You're continually in each other's presence. Do you all understand what we're talking about here? Here's what I want you to understand. When it comes to God living and dwelling inside of us, your goal is not a feeling. Sometimes I think we, we wait for that bolt of lightning or we wait for that audible voice like Samuel laying in bed at night and it's like, Samuel, Samuel. I mean, I think we wait sometimes for God to speak to us like that or we wait for those big dramatic moments. 
The goal is not a feeling, but a continual awareness of God's presence. Whether you feel it or not doesn't change the truth and the reality that if you are in Christ, the Spirit of God dwells in you and he is continually present. And the goal is to invite him into every single area of your life, into every activity, into every conversation, into every problem, into every thought. I was talking about this with um, our seniors on Wednesday in our life management class. We were just going through a book and we were talking about practicing God's presence and how do you include God in every activity, in every thought, in every moment of your life? How do you do that? Well, I I love the verse that says, um, what is the verse and what does it say? (laughs) My mind just slipped. Pray, um, Pray without ceasing. I love the idea behind that verse. How do you pray without ceasing? Praying without ceasing is exactly what we're talking about. It's practicing God's continual presence in our life. Praying without ceasing is, is when you feel that flesh starting to, to well up inside of you. When you're at work and you want to start getting aggravated about a, a conflict or a situation, you know what you do? You're, you acknowledge the presence of God and you say, God, I need your help and I need your strength right now. And guess what the Spirit of God does? He empowers us and energizes us in a way to sp- respond correctly. How do we stay and practice God's continual presence? A constant thanksgiving. God, thank you that I I made it to work okay. Thank you for the rest I had last night. Thank you for my family. Thank you for this food that I'm about to eat. Thank you that that meeting did go well. Thank you that you did intervene in this situation. Just a constant, perpetual state of giving God thanks because his mercies are new and fresh every morning. There's always something to thank God for. He wants us to to cast our cares upon him. He wants us to ask for wisdom. When you're in that moment and you don't know what to do, what does he want you to do? He wants you to acknowledge the fact that you have the Spirit of God there to help you. God, I need your help. I need it right now. I need wisdom on what to say to my child or what to say to this situation. That's how we practice God's presence. And he dwells inside of us. And there's nothing that he delights in more than that. And when we know how to bring God into every moment of our life, he drastically will change everything. It's very similar to the way that it worked when you first fell in love. Or at least it worked for me when I first fell in love. When Alana and I officially started dating, it was the early part of August. And I think it was like, Two or three days later, she had a trip planned to California. And so I was sad that she was leaving. She was going to be gone for seven days. But those seven days were some of our our greatest memories. She's in California. There's a time difference. But, man, we were young and in love. And she would go to her room around 9 or 10 o'clock at night, which is like 11, 12 o'clock our time. And then we would call each other, and we would talk for like four or five hours. I wouldn't go to bed till like four in the morning, sleep for an hour, go to work. And it was all good because I was living on love, man. It was awesome. (laughs) But man, during that time, we just asked each other all kinds of questions. We learned all kinds of things about each other. We laughed. It was really just incredible getting to know each other in that way. Well, then something else phenomenal and amazing happened. When she got back from her trip, it was Christmas in August. I didn't even know she was buying me anything. But you know what happened? My transformation began instantly when we started dating. She opened up her suitcase and she said, I have all of these presents for you. Your wardrobe needs an update. A mass... (laughs) a major drastic overhaul. And she probably had like six or seven shirts, pants, ties, belts. I mean, it wasn't just kind of like an outfit or two. It was like everything's changing. And I loved it. I loved every second of it. I was like, yes, this is great. I don't care. Tell me what looks good. I'll wear it. It's great. And then, you know, like a few days later, a few weeks later, she's like, you know, honestly, I think we need to look at your hair now. If you take your hair... That stuff going straight down, that's not really working. Why don't we just like put it up a little bit? And the transformation just slowly but surely began. All of you are wondering, again, what does this have to do with what we're talking about? I think it's a great illustration of how God wants to work in our hearts and in our lives. As we fall in love with him, as we recognize the fact that he's not just a part of our life, he is our life. There's an intimate relationship that's there. And as we know him and as we discover him, you know what he's going to start doing in our life? He's going to start saying, well, you know what? I really think you should tweak this area. I think you should change this about you. And it's not, he doesn't just dump it all on us at one time. It's a process. It's a relationship. It happens slowly but surely. And as we're living in his presence, he reveals things and he opens up our eyes. 
And he truly transforms and changes everything. Practice God's presence. You want to pursue life in peace? Practice his presence. Watch him transform you into a person that looks and acts like Christ in every single area of your life. All right, and that leads me to the next point. A new perspective. Let's stay in verse 9. A new perspective. Look at verse 9. Look at the end of it. It says, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, the end of this verse says this. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. I want to take a minute just to drive this point home. Last week, we talked about the fact that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul does not ever want us to get far away from the fact, from the realization that not everybody is in Christ Jesus and not everybody has the spirit of God living inside of us. In fact, when we're born into this world, we are not in that state at all. There has to be a transformation that takes place in our life. We are born in this world dead in our sins. We are born in this world as enemies of God. We are born in this world living in our flesh, putting ourselves in that tomb of our own making. There's not really the life and the peace that we're experiencing that God intended for us to experience. But all of that can change in an instant when we put our faith and trust in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. That's the gospel. I beg you, I plead with you. If you don't know Jesus as your savior, if you don't have that confidence and that assurance, if you can't answer instantly, is the spirit of Christ in you? And if you don't know the answer to that, you need to make sure that you have that nailed down. And we would love nothing more than to point you to Jesus because that's all you have to do is believe that he died for you and that you need him to change and to transform your life in every way. So that's a powerful phrase right there. But if you flip that around... Now, if any man not, have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But if you flip that around, now, if any man have the spirit of Christ or has the spirit of Christ, he is all of his. We are Christ's. Do you understand this morning that we are his prized possession? The Bible tells us that we were purchased with a price, and that price was not with corruptible things like gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Jesus. He made a transaction. His blood that was shed on the cross bought us and purchased us. And he didn't just buy us to sell us or to rent us out or just to use us as a commodity. No, he bought us to dwell in us, to live in us, because that is who we are. We are his prized possession. And I love how 1 Corinthians 6 says it. He says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. And why did he buy us with a price? And why does he live and dwell in us? So that we will therefore glorify God in our bodies. So therefore we'll walk in newness of life. Therefore we'll walk in the freedom of the spirit. Therefore we will fulfill the righteousness of the law. And the spirit of God is what energizes us and makes that happen. I love this about the Holy Spirit. He's not outside of us barking commands at us. Saying you better do this. You better be at church. You better give. You better be kind to your neighbor. If you don't, you're not being obedient to me and you're not loving. That's not how he works. The spirit of God dwells in us. He lives in us. There's a relationship that's there. And he's inside of us working on a new heart and a new mind so that we want to do right. And that relationship creates a life that loves and delights in God's law. That's how it works. This morning I got so overwhelmed. I was just I was walking in my garage because it was raining this morning and I was just praying and I'm just wrapping my mind around the truth of what we're talking about here. And I got so thankful and grateful for this relationship that I have with Christ, that it's a relationship that he's slowly working on me because you know what? It's been a process. And it's been a long process, and it will be a long process until the day that I die. I am so thankful that God loves me, and he's kind to me, and he's patient. You don't understand what patience and long-suffering means? When we mess up, it's like when you mess up in your relationship. You go back and you say, I'm sorry, and they forgive, and they love you, and you try to do better. And that's what the Holy Spirit does in our life. We make mistakes. We mess up, and he's there, and he's saying, you know what? I love you. I forgive you. 
My mercies are new and fresh every morning. Great is my faithfulness. Get up today and live in that. And you know what God's word does? It gives us a completely new perspective. It's not about what I have to do and don't have to do. It's about what I get to do because of this amazing relationship that I have with God. So here's the practical application. See everything differently. Oh, we got a gift bag here this morning. And inside of our gift bag is a brand new pair of sunglasses. And these aren't just any sunglasses. These are called the French sunglasses. If you read the description on there, I love what it says about these things. It says, embrace fresh mood every day. (laughs) I haven't got the roses colored back. (laughs) To remind us of the fact that we should see the good. I know these are girly, but that's okay. They have to be rose colored for my point. These things ought to emphasize the cheerful and optimistic view that we should have on life. The way that we see everything differently. I am in the spirit. Let me take these off so you don't laugh all day. Because I don't want you to miss the seriousness of what we're talking about. I am in the spirit. I must set my mind. I must value and treasure the things of the spirit. I must value and treasure the righteousness of the law, God's word. At one time in my life, I'll be honest with you, it felt absolutely impossible. When I was a teenager, a saved teenager, I knew that God wanted me to be a pastor. I did not want to be a pastor. I I was having a hard time surrendering that. I could not wrap my mind around how living a life that's fully dedicated to God's word, that's fully obedient to God's word, could be better than living my life the way that I wanted to. I just could not fully wrap my mind around. I knew it was true, but I was having a hard time surrendering. And then one day... God got a hold of my heart. It was in college. I went to college. I was a pastoral ministries major. I wasn't preaching. I was saying no to opportunities. I didn't want nothing to do with it. I was was still having a hard time just fully surrendering. And I opened up God's word. And I came to Philippians chapter 1 verse 20. And it struck me like it never had before. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. But that with all boldness as always. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death. That day in my dorm room, I surrendered all to God. I said, God, I'm done. I'm not going to be ashamed of you any longer. And as long as I have life and breath to the best of my ability, I know I'm far from perfect, but I want you to be magnified. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And you know what? From that day forward, every single thing about my life changed drastically. He changed my desires slowly but surely. And he's given me the desires of my heart. And he's done exceeding abundantly above anything I could ever ask or think. And when I think about surrender, I look at it differently because I know if I was living according to the flesh, I would not be where God wants me to be. But when you surrender, even though you might not be able to fathom it, trust God and his word because he wants to open up doors of opportunity and blessing and lead you in a life of life and peace. Man, I was thinking about the song that we sung today. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And as a young man, God got a hold of my heart when I surrendered, and I said, okay, I'm going into the ministry, but if I'm going into the ministry, then I'm going to believe that you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever, and I'm not going to talk about a God that did stuff in the past and just long for the future. You're a God of the present. You can still move. You can still work in power. You can still save. You can still transform lives. And can I tell you, God is doing that. Look at this church. Look at the lives that are being changed. On Christmas Eve, we have 12 people that are going to follow the Lord in baptism. God is alive, and he is present, and he is at work, and he is doing the impossible. To God be the glory. God didn't save us to ruin our lives. We are his purchased and prized possession. And he went to extreme lengths and measures to give us this relationship. All we got to do is surrender and trust him and see everything differently. If he says it in his word, then I'm obeying it and I'm living it and I'm doing it. And that leads me to the last thing and we're done. A new priority. A new priority. Look at verse 10. It says, and if Christ be in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. This is just real, solid truth that ought to smack us all in the face. Even though we're saved and the spirit of life is in us, the body is still dead. 
One thing that every single person, whether you're in Christ, whether you have the spirit or not, we are all in mortal bodies that are going to die. Unless the Lord returns in the rapture and we get called home. We're going to die. The body is still dead, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. You know, at the beginning when we're talking about that life and peace, that perpetual state, as you begin to change your perspective and as you begin to focus on that new mindset, as you begin to practice God's presence, you start experiencing the exact opposite of death. You start experiencing what real life was intended to be. And then look what he says in verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. You know what the good news is? Just as certain as Jesus Christ rose again from the grave on the third day, you and I are going to one day, our mortal bodies that are going to die are going to be raised again. And we are going to live in our physical bodies for all of eternity in the presence of Jesus. And what an awesome and glorious day that is going to be. Okay, so he takes us from the present into the future. And then he says in verse 12, therefore, whenever you see that word therefore, you got to stop and see what it's there for. It's, it's there for the reality that we just talked about. We're going to be living in the presence of Jesus in our bodies for all of eternity because the Spirit is going to raise us back to life. And that is going to be our perpetual state forever and ever and ever. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. You know what he's saying? Based on the reality of all that we have in Christ, it's life or death. And we are not debtors to the flesh. Stop living for yourself. Stop living in sin. Stop ignoring God. Stop just having him as part of your life. You are no longer in debt to the flesh. And when you live according to the flesh, it leads to death. So what he says, because we're going to be with Jesus for all of eternity in our bodies, mortify the flesh. Kill it. Kill sin or it will kill you. Don't go through life and miss out on all the gifts and all the blessings that God wants to pour out on you for some momentary pleasure that's going to lead to nothing but brokenness and heartache and death. Mortify the flesh. Kill it and live according to the Spirit and taste the life and peace that he has for you. You know what everybody loves on Christmas Day? A good new toy. <laughs> Man, I was remembering back to when my boys were little. There was always BB guns, dirt Nerf guns, all kinds of stuff like that that were there. And some of our favorite presents are the little gadgets or the little toys that we get sometimes in life or the big toys as you get older that are just, they're awesome and they're exciting. And you know what? How do we, how do we mortify the flesh? We do it through the Spirit. And in Ephesians chapter 6, you know what the Bible tells us? That we're to put on the whole armor of God. That we're to stand strong in, the, we're to stand strong in our faith. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And one of the pieces of armor is a weapon. It's the sword of the spirit, which is the, which is the word of God. The real gift that changes everything. That empowers everything that we just got done talking about is right here in this book. I cannot magnify the truth of God's word enough. Everything that we just talked about, everything that we just talked about, you want a new mindset? You want to experience life and peace? You want to practice the presence of God? You want a new perspective, a fresh outlook on everything in life. Master the sword. Master the sword. We got a room full of the majority of people in here are believers, but I promise you there's many believers in here that haven't picked this book up once this entire week. And we wonder why we live in perpetual frustration and fear and worry and why the enemy gets a hold of us and discourages us and breaks us down. 
This book right here is alive. This book pierces even to the dividing asunder. It gets into the the very joints and marrow, into the very being of who we are. And it opens up our eyes to the truth of who God is. And it's the secret that will unlock life and peace. If you learn how to master the sword, I promise you, your perspective will change. And as your perspective changes, it'll help you to sit in the presence of God. And as you sit in the presence of God, hey, you'll experience life and peace, that perpetual state of happiness. And you know what? It's as simple as just opening up this book, not because you have to, not to cross off your list if you did your devotions for today, but because you will find everything you need in God's word. Look at what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 3. He, therefore, that ministers to you the Spirit. And what's it say next? And worketh. <laughs> he, therefore, that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you. Doeth he it by the works of the law? Is the miracles that's happening in your life because you're in church today? Is the miracles that are happening in your life because you give? Are the miracles that are happening in your life because you read the Bible and because you prayed and because you sing and you do all the right things in your life? If your perspective on doing those things is to produce the change, you're wrong and you're off basis. The miracles that he doeth in you are not by the works of the law. They're by the hearing of faith. You open up this book. You realize that it will change everything. And if God says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, then you want to be exactly where his people are and exactly where his presence is. Because you have that relationship inside of you that is drawing you to himself. If he says that sexual sins outside of marriage will destroy you and lead to death, then you say, okay, I'm going to live a clean and pure life because I trust God and I trust his word and I don't want to do anything that would cause me to miss out on that special relationship that I have with him. You understand what I'm saying? You want miracles at work among you? (laughs) This book right here is the key. This book will unlock every door that needs to be unlocked in your life and God will transform and change everything.